Hello and welcome. This is the last talk in a series on social justice hosted by our core organizer, the S. Daniel Abraham Center for International and Regional Studies. The center promotes interdisciplinary scholarship and teaching on issues of global importance with special focus on inter-ethnic and inter-religious conflict around the world. Uh, I'm Liora Hendelman Bavour, director of the ACIS, the Alliance Center for Iranian Studies. The ACIS is an interdisciplinary research center focusing on the promotion of knowledge and understanding of Iran with special emphasis on the history and experience of Iranian Jewry. Today, we will try and answer a billion dollar question with the upcoming presidential elections in Iran. Is reform in the Islamic Republic possible? With us today, a phenomenal cast of experts, our keynote speaker, Alex Vatanka, senior fellow and director of the Iran program at the Middle East Institute in Washington, D.C. He's also uh, the author of The Battle of the Ayatollahs in Iran, the United States, Foreign Policy and Political Rivalry since 1979, came out less than a month ago by uh, I.B. Uh, Taurus. Our commentator today is my distinguished teacher and colleague, Professor Meir Litvak, a professor at the Department of Middle Eastern and African History at Tel Aviv University, former director and senior research associate of the ACIS and senior researcher at the Moshe Dayan Center. His most recent book was by Brill, titled Know Thy Enemy, Evolving Attitudes Towards Others in Modern Shiite Thoughts, and practice. Without further ado, I will transfer the screen to our uh, guest speaker. Uh, Alex, the floor is yours, and thanks uh, to all of you for uh, joining us. Thank you, Leora. It's, uh, it's, it's a pleasure to, to join you all today. Uh, I wish I had the opportunity to be in Tel Aviv in person, uh, but you know maybe at some later point. But it's great to, to be with you and, and see some friends. I, I won't be long-winded today. Uh, I know you gave me half an hour. I see how long I can, I can um, go through my points, but you know, we have such a st uh, distinguished um, group of people here, Meir, David, uh, and I'm not gonna tell you anything that you don't already know, but I hope I can set the stage for a conversation. Uh, with that said, I hope you don't mind. I'm gonna go through some uh, points that I wrote down, again, for the sake of um, making sure I, I maximize on the time we have. And I just want to tell you what I see has happened over the last few weeks. And I love to hear your uh, thoughts. As I said, this is such a distinguished class, uh, group of uh, Iran uh, watchers and experts that uh, I don't want to, uh, you know, uh, pretend that I'm going to reveal anything that um, you don't uh, know. Uh, but what I'm interested in, in any, anything that you uh, think I might uh, put too much emphasis on. I guess the, 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 the part I'm excited about is where do I perhaps put too much or too little emphasis on some of the key points that we are all aware of. So the two key, key issues I wanted to sort of get to today uh, are the following questions. How has this election process so far been handled by the Islamic Republic? And what does it tell us about Ayatollah Ali Khamenei's calculations? And the second question, uh, really to the headline for today's event is, what does it all mean for the state of reform movement in Iran and its future? Look, in terms of the process, I think most of us would, would agree that if there is one headline catching what's going on is Ayatollah Khamenei screaming, I don't care about the people. I think everything he's done so far suggests that he really uh, couldn't care less at this point in his life, in his uh, position of a supreme leader, position he's, he's held since 1989. He, he's not about uh, uh, worrying about upsetting people's feelings. It's all about the succession process. It's all about making sure the legacy that he wants to leave behind can be protected. And I'm sure he's also interested in making sure the debate of Khamenei, the household of Khamenei will be protected going forward. I suspect Khamenei doesn't want to see what happened to the debate of Ayatollah Khomeini happen to the debate of Khamenei after his death. Look, Khamenei, as we all know, controls the Guardian Council and its vetting process this time around has been hugely controversial, even within the Islamic Republic. I mean, some of us don't take Iranian elections seriously, haven't done for a long time. 
But you know, in Iran, there were still those who were hanging on to the hope that gradual reform in the system is possible. Well, if you had that hope, you probably don't have it today, the way the Guardian Council basically uh, you know, took ev every candidate that was worth anything out of the contention before the race had even started. Uh, the five-day registration period, you had 592 individuals registering at the Ministry of Interior, including 40 women. Uh, and bless their hearts, they show up and register knowing full well they're not going to be allowed to run. Um, but within, you know, a day or two, um, the Guardian Council uh, spokesperson, Kat Khodai, came out and said, you know, 95%, about 95% about of these people who registered will not even be considered it, you know, the list of people who we consider to run will be around 10 people. It turned out to be seven people. Uh, the Guardian Council, just to show you how reckless it has been, didn't even take 10 days to assess each uh, candidate's qualifications. Um, they really wanted to sort of make a headline here to say this is not going to be one of those elections like, say, 97, where there'll be surprises where you have a Mohammed Khatami type of winner. Um, and they definitely achieved that uh, objective. Among the seven men um, that you know were allowed by the Guardian Council to to run, um, yeah, five of them clearly come from what they what we call the Usul Gara camp or the hardline camp. Um, the two ones that are in the race as of today, as far as I know, uh, Hemmati and uh, Mohsen Mehralizadeh are you know one is a Mehralizadeh can be classified as someone with a pedigree um, linked to the reform movement, uh, and Abdul Nasser Hemmati is a technocrat. I'll get to those two individuals later on. Um, the ones that did not make the cut um, that stood out, and you know there was some potential excitement around them running where Ali Larijani did not make the cut, Ishaq Jahangiri, Ali Mutahari, and Mustafa Tajzadeh. Uh, I mean, the, but the fact that the folks like Ali Larijani or Jahangiri, or even Ali Mutahari, these are all, to my uh, understanding of the history of the Islamic Republic, none of these uh, individuals really had reformist creden credentials. They all come from a reformist background one way or another. They might say certain, say certain things that make him stand out from the fold of hardline thinking. I mean, Ali Mutahari has come out in recent weeks, for example, and talked about, you know, the need to uh, uh, fix relations with the United States. But overall, their political background has not been linked to the reform camp. And the fact that they were seen as, as hopes for the reform uh, movement as candidates just shows you how desperate the situation has become for the reformist uh, uh, political class in, in Iran. Among the independents, if you will, and I'm probably going to upset some of you who are just mentioning his name, but here I go, was Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, right? Uh, Ahmadinejad, who we kind of knew, and he knew, uh, would be disqualified, would not be allowed to run by the Guardian Council, was one of the ones who came out and spoke probably in the most forceful language, most notably, as you know, at the Ministry of Interior, he said, if I'm not allowed to run, I will not only not vote, but I will not back the election result. Quite, quite interesting because he's putting some red lines there and kind of shaping the, the political uh, uh, you know, discourse, if you will, of this election cycle, uh, if not dominates or has the potential to dominate the, the, um, the opponents to the, election, um, uh, to the election process, which is interesting. So we were expecting the reform movement and ca characters linked to, the, linked to the reform movement be the ones who will be the counter to what Khamenei and the hardline camp were about, but they were so toothless that it's someone like Mahmoud Ahmadinejad who might just uh, occupy that uh, space, that political space. Um, one other point I should make out because this is something that might be important going forward in terms of the post election period to come is that uh, you know, the Guardian Council decided to act in such a reckless manner, if you will, disqualifying the way it did in the manner that it did and the individuals that it sidelined at a time where it is very obvious and has been obvious for weeks and months that the turnout will be historically low, right? Uh, I mean, if you believe the figures, for example, in 2008, 17 and in 2013 presidential elections, you had something between 73 and 70, 73 
percent turnout in 2017, about 72% in 2013. This time around, and these are probably optimistic figures, they're expecting 20 to 30% turnout. That's a 50% plus drop in vote voter turnout. In any political system, that uh, is, is, uh, should be raising alarms for the ruling class. But you know, I don't see any signs of Ayatollah Khamenei uh, changing his ways. For example, what he has done in previous elections with the Guardian Council has uh, disqualified certain prominent figures. Khamenei, as the supreme leader, has the you know, political weight to come in and force a candidate back into the race. He can basically override the Guardian Council. And there's a lot of uh, expectation that two individuals in particular would benefit from this, Ali Darajani and Ishaq Jahangiri, and that didn't happen. Instead, Khamenei came out with guns out and he was saying, you know, Guardian Council did their job, good job, just get on with it, no questions asked. And, and uh, again, that tells you quite a bit about Khamenei's political calculations. And this is a message you will hear me again and again, and I love to get to this in the conversation to come shortly, which is Khamenei is not looking at this election in terms of what the election will do, it has nothing to do with the nuclear negotiations, Vienna, US-Iran relations, or anything in, in terms of Iranian agenda in the region. This is all about uh, paving the way for the post khamenei period to come. And he clearly wants somebody who can he can trust um, uh, or has control over, and I believe Ibrahim Raisi, the front runner among the hardliners, fits that uh, that sort of uh, persona for him. Um, you know, the fact that you have some of these candidates who have been rejected by the Guardian Council coming out and, and saying, what was the reason? Uh, what was the reason for the disqualification? I mean, with someone like Ali Rajani, who has been a, an advisor, close advisor to the Supreme Leader, uh, and suddenly is told that he isn't fit to run for the presidency. What does that tell us about the, not just the thinkings about Khamenei, because as I said, I think a lot of Khamenei's think is about the post Khamenei era to come, but what does it potentially uh, tell us about the fragility of the Islamic Republic within the regime tent, within the regime tent? I mean, that is a, one of the unknown big obviously questions. But what we do know for sure is that it's really creating a lot of anger within what I would describe traditional hardline corners. I mean, someone like Ahmad Tawakkuli, who himself ran for the presidency, is a member of the Expediency Council. You know, when he comes out and publicly says, the Guardian Council, you can't do this. You have to change your ways. That just tells you the, the, the level of anger inside uh, the regime. Um, there was a footnote to all of this, for me at least, because I was sitting there watching and you know, uh, thinking the performance of the Revolution Guards might be, or candidates coming from the rank of the Revolution Guards might be the one thing to watch out for. In the end, so far, I mean, uh, they were allowed to run. And as we all know, in the last minute, in recent weeks, the Iranian Constitutional Court announced that officers of a rank of major general and higher can run for the presidency. You didn't need a constitutional uh, verdict on that. This was a political decision. This was Khamenei's decision. He wanted to let the uh, guardsmen be able to join the ranks of the candidates for this presidential race. I don't know the answer, but part of this strategy could be because um, Khamenei couldn't say no to them. Simply just doesn't have the political power to say no to the Revolutionary Guards. I don't necessarily myself buy into that. I don't think there is this one powerful Revolutionary Guards um, voice that pressures, uh, uh, pressurizes, I should say, Khamenei. And we've seen the splits in, in, in the Revolutionary Guards. I mean, someone like Said Mohammad, the, the, the pushback he got from other factions within the Revolutionary Guards was quite telling about splits within the Guards. But, you know, it's still, it's, it's one reason that Khamenei decided that, you know, let them run. Um, uh, and the other reason, again, linked up to the post, um, post Khamenei era to come is that he just doesn't have anybody else to turn to in terms of support. And he needs more and more Revolutionary Guards involvement in the political process outside of what the Revolutionary Guards in the realm of military, economic and security affairs, but more sort of in the political uh, affairs of the country because that gives him, uh, that gives Khamenei uh, more comfort in terms of the, sh the regime uh, ship staying intact the day he dies. Uh, he, he doesn't certainly have that trust in the clerics in Qom or Mashhad. He, he has some trust in the clerics in Qom and Mashhad. Arguably, the reason why Ibrahim Raisi is 
is the front runners because of a understanding uh, in, in, in the clerical circles. Certainly, uh, Raisi's father-in-law, uh, Ayatollah Ala Mahoda, is probably pushing for, for uh, Ibrahim Raisi to, to, to be the one that the Supreme Leader Khamenei considers as his, um, if you will, the savior of his legacy. Um, I wanted to sort of say, um, I mean, I should mention that one Revolution Guards candidate who's obviously in the race is Mohsen Rezaei, but that doesn't uh, uh, surprise anybody. Poor Mohsen Rezaei has been a candidate since 2005 for every election, and he does poorly in every election. I understand he's even had to have some Botox uh, treatment to, to sort of uh, peer the part this time around, but who knows? I mean, some there are some, if you read Iranian uh, media, I'm sure most of you do, there are suggestions that he might be the, um, the main challenger to, to Ibrahim Raisi, that it won't be Saeed Jalili or, or Hemmati, that it would be Rezaei that would be the uh, main uh, challenger to Ibrahim Raisi, which is, you know, if that is true, I, I doubt it, but if that's true, just shows you how limited this election really is that you have someone like Ramos and Erezai and someone like Ibrahim Raisi battling it out, battling out in the, in the realm of ideas. Okay, I, I wanna sort of spend 10 minutes, if I may, uh, to 11.30, quickly go through some of the issues for the reformists. Uh, uh, from get-go, they obviously had a problem finding a credible candidate, okay? Um, they were desperate. Uh, they expected mass dis disqualification as happened in the last Majlis elections. Uh, but I guess somewhere down in their hearts, they thought maybe Khamenei really wants to avoid an embarrassment, wants the sort of Republican part of the Islamic Republic stay somewhat alive, and therefore he needs some something that looks like a half-decent election turnout. Therefore, he might let reformers run. Khamenei didn't. Going back to my initial thoughts uh, at the top of the my remarks, Khamenei doesn't care. He's not going to risk anything. Um, and clearly, that's why he chose... Uh, you know, he doesn't want to surprise election outcome. That's why he chose uh, Raisi. Speaking of Raisi, very quickly, I don't want to really get into to, to Raisi. But I'm sure we'll talk about him. But, you know, the, the, the question right now is how quickly will the hardline camp consolidate around him? You know, people from the Paidari fa faction, they will have split. Some will stay with Say Jelly. Others might switch over to Raisi. And remember, Raisi doesn't run as a hardline candidate. I mean, he, he wants to be an independent candidate. Um, how he's going to sell that is going to be interesting. But he has proven to, in the past, to attract, you know, voters uh, or support from factions that he that is not necessarily his his political home. I mean, his campaign manager, uh, Ali Nikzad, is a, is a famous cabinet minister from the Ahmadinejad government. So, uh, you know, the, the question is, there will, well, I should say, the point is there will be consolidation around Raisi. Once people realize this is a foregone conclusion to some extent, it is already a foregone conclusion, then he, there will be consolidation. But the question is, uh, who will not join Raisi? Who will not back uh, Raisi? And, and, and um, what, what damage would that do in the first round of the elections? I mean, the key here for Ace is to get to the 50% if he wants to have a, a win after the first uh, round. Um, I mean, the fact that the national TV is pretty much at Ace's disposal also shows you that Khamenei couldn't care less about uh, the perception that he has chosen his candidate. This is what he, who he wants for the presidency. Um, and I think that's the first time. I mean, Khamenei has never done this before. I mean, Khamenei has in the past been known to favor a candidate. Nautaka in 97 famously, uh, and obviously we know Mahmoud Ahmadinejad in 2009, and the outcome in those two elections were very different. But this time around, he's not even waiting for the election result. In the case of 2009, he, he sort of came in late and decided to shape events in a certain direction. But this time around, he's taking no chances. He's, 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 he's involved in the pre-election phase that we haven't really seen him be uh, involved at this, uh, uh, at this cost for him politically before. Um, and you, know, you could say, again, this is a point you will hear me say, and this is a somewhat of controversial point, this idea of uniformity in the regime so that the, the regime doesn't fall apart the day Khamenei dies. And everyone knows this, but he's 82, uh, and his succession is a key issue for, for him. 
Going back to the reformists, look, you tell me if you see reformists push back. I love to hear it. Maybe you haven't paid as, as much attention to it. And I'll tell you why I might not pay attention to it. Frankly, long time ago, I lost respect for the reform movement leaders in Iran. And once you lose respect for some, somebody, uh, I guess in my case, it means less interest in what they say and what they do. But certainly from what I can pick up, they've done nothing to stand up to Khamenei. They did nothing to, to Khamenei, who probably at this point, we have to assume had a hand in the so-called Zarif tape uh, interview leak, uh, which you know Zarif at the time was being considered as a, a potential presidential hope for the reformers. Not, was, not only was he taken out of contention, he was humiliated and Khamenei did nothing to save Zarif. Uh, I mean, don't look for personal favors here from Khamenei. He, the, the speech that Khamenei gave afterwards, uh, that after that leak, uh, just, uh, you know, was nothing but to, to sort of uh, further marginalize and further humiliate Zarif. Uh, there have been a number of candidates with genuine reform pedigree. I want to mention a few names. You, you know him, Mustafa Kabakabian, um, head of the Mardum Salari, uh, uh, Salari Party. Masoud um, Pezeshkian, Deputy Speaker of Masoud, who just gave a pretty uh, interesting uh, uh, criticism of his disqualification, disqualification in, in the Majlis. Mustafa Taj, so that was the one everybody was getting excited about because he's been the most outspoken and most head-on critic of Khamenei in recent years, and he's gone to prison for it. Uh, Mohsede Mehralizadeh is, is, is someone, as we know, he, he got about, I think, 4% in 2005. Um, Mahmoud Sadri, another Majlis member, did not make it. Well, uh, he was not uh, allowed to run. Uh, and there are individuals like Rasul Mojtabaniya, who's a uh, uh, Mehdi Karabi uh, ally, wasn't allowed to, to run. To me, the fact that Muhammad Khatami, again, someone who I think long time ago, if he had any political courage, would have stood up to Khamenei, uh, the fact that he comes out and says that uh, the, the largest reformist camp that he represents, the Majmai Rohanyan Mubarez, or the Association of Competent Clerics, will not back a single candidate. I mean, if you go that far, why not just come out and say, we ask for a boycott of the elections? Because that's what the Iranian people want, a boycott of the elections. If Mohammed Khatami came and said, general strike, don't come out, this is the only way they can save some of their integrity, integrity that I think they lost a long time ago. Uh, Khatami, and I would include someone like Hassan Rouhani, who is not, as we know, a reformist, but benefited from the sort of the reform voters' willingness to give him a chance as well. Here, Khatami is coming out and says, we're not, we're not going to support a single candidate. But I just think they could have gone further. They could have said, we asked for a general strike. And they're not doing that. And that's been always the problem with the reform leaders. They just don't take that stance. In that sense, you've got to respect Ahmadinejad a lot more. He takes chances. Ahmadinejad clearly is ready to go to prison for, her, for, for his political career. Khatami is not. All right, I'm going to try and wrap up fast because I'm coming close to the, uh, my time here. But. Um, uh, you know, some of the slogans that you're going to hear in these three presidential debate coming up are, I mean, I, they really have no respect for the integrity and the intelligence of the Iranian voters. I mean, it's going to be about subsidies. It's, it's going to be, you know, we're going to give out loans, low interest loans. Nobody's going to touch the big elephants in the room. U.S.-Iran relations, uh, you know, foreign policy that's at the heart of so much of Iran's uh, uh, you know, problems at home, abroad. Nobody's going to go there because they know if they go there at any moment, even right now, Khamenei can ask them to, to, to withdraw or they, they have to be pulled uh, pull out of the, from the race. So um, two issues for me about the reform movement, and then I think I'm going to move towards wrapping up, is um, um, Jahangiri, Ishaq Jahangiri was supposed to be a leading candidate to capture the reform movement. He was disqualified. That role has now been given to Abdul Nasser Hemmati, a central bank governor who, who was fired or resigned, depending who you ask. Uh, he's a technocrat. Hemmati's wife is the biggest headline so far from his campaign because, uh, you know, she gave an interview that people thought for a female, amazingly, that was, uh, she was very refreshing to see on national TV. He's a technocrat, and I know today he's in his karate gear. He's, uh, he's going to be depicted as this sort of, uh, 
you know, can do it all type of a figure. But end of the day, I, I doubt very much Hamati is going to be able to do anything um, uh, to, to capture much of the uh, reform voters for one simple reason. Reform voters are not going to come out. Uh, the reform voters are not going to come out. And they see through uh, the, the charade of having Hamati approved uh, to run because um, uh, that's Khamenei's safe token reform candidate so he can say that, you know, the elections were free. All right. Um, the one other thing I should say about the Hemati campaign or the, how Hemati and Mehrali Zade campaigns will perform is, again, I, I made this point just earlier, but I think it's important. Will anybody from the reform movement, anybody worth listening to come out and, and, and express the B word, boycott the elections, general strike. This is an insult to our intelligence uh, that this is, you know, uh, and you see this in social media people saying they're not going to vote. There are other people who are saying the, the Republican part of the Islamic Republic died uh, a long time ago, but Khamenei made sure it's something that everyone understands, that Iran is now becoming a caliphate and Khamenei is, is you know, uh, Mullah Omar or uh, Abu Bakr Baghdadi, that type of leader. Uh, and let's just accept that that's the system we have now. And then we can make a decision on what to do next. Do you still believe in gradual reform in such a system? Or are you gonna go be more radical in your political aspirations? Um, Rafsanjani network, if, if the old Rafsanjani, you, know, you asked about my book, which is about Khamenei and Rafsanjani. I mean, if there is any um, uh, Rafsanjani network uh, left uh, that can do anything to stand up to Khamenei, Someone like uh, uh, Jahangiri, who comes from the Rafsanjani network, uh, would have would have been a bit uh, more active uh, in running, and would have certainly made more noise when disqualified. They haven't done it. And by the way, Rafsanjani's own son, uh, Mohsen, was disqualified. Um, so I, I, at this point, I don't know uh, if we should expect any surprises to come out from the old Rafsanjani network, that old uh, faction that used to be able to stand up to Khamenei, today seems to be as uh, the weakest it has been. One individual who has some potential, uh, and these will be my last words, again, and I, you're going to hate me for this, but you know, when I tell you your hope is Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, you're not going to like me. And I get that. I don't like myself for saying that, but he's the one who has stood up to Khamenei, and he is now saying things that are genuinely embarrassing to the regime. As a two-term president, when he says it, it it's just, it's, you know, it, it, it signifies something different and it impacts in a different way. Um, I mean, his, his last interview or some of his last remarks, for example, when he says, listen, the intelligence service in the, in the Islamic Republic are busy monitoring me and I've told them, I offered them to carry a camera around wherever I go so they don't have to spy on me. And I urged them instead to watch what Mossad does because then he revealed something that we didn't know before. Uh, the, apparently uh, an Israeli orchestrated operation with you know, digging or, draw or, or making a hole on the roof of a building and, and taking national secrets away. He said, worry about that. Again, uh, we can laugh it off, but these are the types of uh, you know, tough questions that someone like Ahmadinejad is actually bringing to, to the conversation, which is hard for, for the likes of Khamenei and the Revolution Guards to dismiss. Um, I just wish, I just wish the reform movement, people like Muhammad Khatami, even someone like Hassan Rouhani would have been a bit more outspoken. And, and actually, let me just sit, finish up with Hassan Rouhani. He does have the option in his last hour, if you will, to do something, to stand up. And now he's written a letter to Khamenei about the disqualifications, but he's essentially technically the boss over the process. Uh, he, you know, he, the Minister of Interior, the people who oversee this election, um, uh, uh, answer to Rouhani. So at, at least if there is any sign of mass fraud, and there might be mass fraud. I understand that they're not going to use fingerprints this time around, which means fraud will be easier to carry out this time around as compared to previous years. You would hope someone like Hassan Rouhani would have it in him, a little bit of personal pride to say, if that happened on my watch, I'm going to speak up. But unfortunately, and this is the this is a problem with whether you're a reformer or moderate or something, they're all allowing this, themselves knowingly to be played by Khamenei. And Khamenei's objective, as, as we know, is for this election to help him consolidate and pave the way forward for the post-Khamenei era to come, whether it is gonna be a Mujtaba Khamenei, a 
a, supreme, a, a, a successor to his father or Ibrahim Raisi or whoever it is, it's something that he wants to make sure he has maximum control over in, 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 in shaping going forward. And that's, that's his ultimate uh, goal in, in, in his engineering of these elections and his willingness to pay this political price uh, for it. Anyway, I'll stop here and I will go back to Leora, I, I will stop unless, uh, I, and I'm going to mute myself okay. because I think Professor Ludwig is going to speak. Yes, yes. Okay, thank you very much, Alex. You raised a very interesting and important point. Um, we will uh, move now uh, to uh, Mayor. Mayor, just unmute yourself. Okay. Hi, good evening. I, sorry for the dark picture that you, you probably see here. Uh, well, let me just say that in general, I agree with almost everything that Alex said. I don't think that I'm going to dispute him on any, any point. So maybe what I will try to do is focus on some points, uh, some, maybe some, some of the long-term processes that I see. And I see here, I think, at least two, two major things. One is that uh, if you look historically at the history of the uh, Islamic Republic or from the Islamic Revolution to the current elections, I see a process, a continuation of a process of the narrowing down of the social basis of the regime. And if you looked at the UN revolution, historically, this was one of the most popular uh, revolutions in modern history. Uh, the, one of the broadest social political coalitions that rallied against the Shah. And gradually, first the regime got rid of the non-Islamist uh, factors, and then they got rid of the let's say the non-clerical Islamists. Later we had getting rid of the liberals within the Islamic system, the Islamist factions. Reformists were out. We thought they were coming in with Rouhani, not so successfully. And now what we see is even further narrowing down because even centrist figures like Larry Jani and like others have been ousted. So what we have left out is very much, I would say, maybe the hardline faction or factions within, within the regime. So that is from the extremely wide socio-political coalition, gradually, systematically, the, the base of support is narrowing down. Now, which on the one hand can be seen as a sign, sign of strength for the system. I agree with Alex, they don't care maybe what the people say or not care so much. But in the long run, it may prove to be a weak a weakness of the regime in the long run. Again, I don't know when and how, but it may, may pose a long-term threat to the regime once the social basis is narrowing down. This is one phenomenon I think to look at. Another point is, and here I agree with Alex, historically, I mean, the Islamic Republic has never been, of course, a democracy, but they always took care to, I would say, um, stand on two legs. One is, you can say, uh, or, uh, the dictatorial leg, or if you can put it in the theological terms, the entesab, we are being, we are appointed by God, we owe our legitimacy to God, therefore uh, we have a right and a duty to impose our will uh, on the people and even and use force if necessary to sustain the Islamic system. On the other hand, there was always the need and the awareness to keep and maintain the popular, popular support for the regime, the popular base of support. Okay? I mean, the, the, the regime's insistence, you could say almost obsession in holding so many election campaigns, okay? presidency, uh, parliament, Madrasa uh, Khobregan, and uh, once uh, municipal elections, reflected the need of the regime to show that they enjoy popular support. And all, you know, Khamenei always said, you know, when you go and vote, it doesn't matter what you vote for. The moment you vote, you vote for the Islamic Republic. You prove, uh, you show the legitimacy of the Islamic Republic. But what we see here is growing abandonment of the popular foundation, popular pillar, and greater reliance, I would say, on suppression. And when Alex says, and I agree with him, they don't care so much what the people are saying. They know apparently that there will be a fairly low voter turnout. 
uh, maybe they don't care. Now the question is then why is it? Why 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 do they rely more on suppression oppression than on popular support? And here you can maybe reach two uh, completely contradictory answers, and I don't know which. One is that they are so overconfident. Okay, they are so certain of themselves. They are so, I would say, dismissive of any opposition. And here, by the way, not 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 reformists, but even something less, much further than reformists. They know, feel that the people are either too weak, too demoralized, too unorganized. Uh, and I always said, you know, being from an older generation, with all due respect to the social networks. In fact, they have undermined the opposition movement, they have not strengthened the opposition movement, and the regime maybe thinks that either they can control it or can divert the energy of the social networks to completely apolitical venues instead of politics. So either they are overconfident and they think they can afford to ignore what the people think and want, or it's a combination which sometimes you heard, by the way, with the Shah. Overconfidence hiding insecurity, deep insecurity. Uh, and, and maybe they are still fearful of their, uh, of their regime uh, and of their legitimacy and of the people. And therefore they believe that, uh, again, here, Alex said they don't give it, uh, they don't care about the people, or you can say they know that the people don't like them anyway. They know that 40 years after the revolution, there is no way the regime can ever regain widespread legitimacy and popularity anymore. So why even try? We can only rely on uh, an oppression. So maybe it is a reflection of, again, of a sense of insecurity, that they feel that the only thing that can keep the regime in power is, uh, again, uh, oppression. Now, I have to admit, I don't know which, which is more correct. Is it, again, overconfidence or certain insecurity? I think. Probably, I would if I look uh, to, to another thing to have to sustain this position. I think that when Iranians and especially Khamenei, uh, we know that he has been traumatized by the fall of the Soviet Union uh, with uh, the idea of uh, you know Glasnost and the perestroika of Gorbachev. When you bring any liberalization, will bring about the collapse of the regime. Uh, on the one hand, and again, he is probably looking at China with envy. Okay? That Chinese dictatorship, and I would even say China is advancing quickly toward totalitarianism. And maybe Khamenei sees China as something to look for and admire. You know, I wish I, I, I wish I could be, I could do what the Chinese are doing. Okay, from, from his point of view. And maybe a third element here is the so-called Arab Spring where uh, Khamenei reached the conclusion, again, if you allow the people too much, what you get is uh, Syria, Ye uh, Yemen, or, or, uh, or let's say Egypt. You don't want that. And therefore, you need to uh, maintain, again, tight control and uh, abandon all the niceties about, uh, again, pluralism and vote, etc. Uh, better, better safe than sorry, OK? And, and may maybe this is the reason uh, for the uh, uh, policy. Uh, I fully agree with what Alex said about the weakness of the reformists. And here uh, I, uh, you know, I point, let me point to certain things which uh, Raj Simt has written a lot about, you know, that the reformists have lost, I mean, they're weak, weak vis a vis Khamenei, but they've lost support of the people also. There's tremendous disappointment and frustration from the reformists. And I don't think they pose any uh, serious threat. And again, here, if I look at, I, I like historical analogies. I think that what happened to reformists in, in, in Iran is something what, uh, similar to what happened to the liberals in Tsarist Russia from 1905 to 1917. They tried to uh, change the system from within. Eventually, they were crushed they, they were too liberal for the Tsar, and they were too timid and obedient for most people, and eventually they lost from both. And they were driven over by, the, in, in Russia, and by the Bolsheviks in Iran, not by some radical left-wingers or, uh, God forbid, the liberal, Western liberals, but, but they were being run over for the time being 
by uh, the hardliners, uh, revolutionary guards, uh, etc. And I think it's the tragedy of those who try who believe that you can uh, again change a system like the Iranian from within by uh, being nice, okay, showing the human face of Islam. Apparently, certain, certain dictatorships it never works. So uh, uh, now. Uh, there is a, a, an interesting phenomenon here, uh, with, of, again, that it's Raisi as a candidate vis -a -vis versus too many former revolutionary guards. Now, I agree that Iran is not, and again, interesting and significantly, at least as we can see, Raisi is the forerunner. He is the leading candidate, which means that the revolutionary guards is even if even if they increase their influence on the political system, they still don't dominate it. The person, persons who dominate the political system are still clerics, Khamenei and supporters, but it does show you again the greater importance of the revolutionary guards for the clerics. And I agree here that the clerics need the revolutionary guards. They cannot afford to control Iran without the revolutionary guards. But again, with all due respect, I agree by the way, revolutionary guards have probably never been monolithic. Uh, not that there may be some closet reformists within the Russian guards. I think this hope is gone. Uh, Kalibaf in the past pretended to be such uh, sort of a, an Islamic Reza, Reza Khan, a reformist with Islamic garb. I think these hopes are probably gone. But uh, again, there are, maybe again the internal divisions will, uh, will uh, uh, weaken them. Um, another uh, now, another question is, assuming that we're all correct and that RIC will win, okay, then comes the big question. Many people, and I say myself included, believe that RIC was being groomed to succeed Khamenei. Okay? That uh, I fully agree that Khamenei cares about his legacy. I think is a problem of Iran 2065 is uh, what's how he wants to project his legacy for future generations. He probably cares about his family. Maybe he can reach a you know, Yeltsin style formula that whoever succeeds him will uh, uh, pledge not to hurt his family. I doubt that Khamenei will be that audacious or uh, not even audacious, I would say um, careless enough to appoint his son. Uh, certainly after the so called Arab Spring. Also, because it is very, it runs very much against Iranian tradition, clerical tradition, sons can replace their fathers in administrative positions. You know, in, in clerical establishment, this happened throughout the 19th century, but not as spiritual leaders. That never happened. And especially when Mujtaba, with all due respect, is not this great scholar uh, and so on. So, uh, but, and if Right, I, I believe I was among those who believe that Tracy was being groomed for the lead, for being the leader. Uh, succeed Khamenei. The question is, will his election as forecasted election as a president will it help or harm his prospects for being the next uh, leader? On the one hand, you can say it may increase his power. Uh, on the other hand, if he becomes a president, he loses his grip on two probably more powerful institutions, the judiciary, and uh, is the deputy head of the Madassi Khobregan, uh, with Janati being 93 years old, eventually Janati will die. I mean, he, he seems to be, you know, uh, eternal, but he will die at some point, uh, maybe 200 years from now. But once Raisi will have to deal with the serious structural socioeconomic problems of Iran. And even if they reach the nuclear deal and the sanctions will be removed, uh, the likelihood that you know investments worth hundreds of billions of dollars flowing to Iran is not that great, considering Iranian corruption, bureaucracy, and by the way, the interest of the uh, guards who do not want to open the Iranian economy to the, to the world, then, then the chances of, I would say, economic prosperity that will be, will help Raisi to build himself as the inevitable leader may not be that great. And maybe there's this danger for Raisi that if he will become president, 
and he will have to take the blame for many of the problems that Iran is facing and is likely to face. Here, I'm not sure that he's doing, doing himself a favor if he becomes a president. So I think here, I, again, I don't know, but I say that it's still open whether or not becoming a president will help him uh, is, is bid for leadership. Two slight uh, uh, points. Um, we speak about you know, ignore, disregarding popular wish. But I think that what is, what is going on here, there's even greater disregard for specific sections of the population. And here what I'm speaking more are the minorities. Uh, you know, Bernard Orcard, who's been a visitor of the center for several times, showed very clearly, very convincingly, if you look at all previous elections, which were relatively free, I mean, those who were relatively free, not 2009, minorities tended to vote much more strongly for reformist candidates. Now, with this option is gone, with this option is gone, basically the minorities are completely left out in the lurch. Will that have an impact on the minorities in the long run? Again, I don't know. Uh, but I think this is a, a dangerous development from the regime's point of view, okay? That these people will be even more marginalized than what they are now. And finally, Alex spoke about Ahmadinejad as the only person who challenged the system. I agree. Perhaps, Ahmadinejad, again, as someone said, that that's not my idea, is thinking of himself as the next leader of Iran, not as president, not as Rahaba, he's not a cleric, but as a duce or some, something like this, uh, as a future Islamic revolutionary populist uh, leader uh, who will take over Iran after uh, Khamenei dies. And maybe this is why he allows himself to become, to be so, uh, Again, audacious against uh, the, the system. So I will uh, uh, stop here and uh, allow other people to, to speak. Okay, thank you very much, Mayor. Uh, do you think, uh, and here uh, any one of you can uh, uh, take this question, do you think a gradual economic link with the global economy? and further globalization will bring some sort of, of reform uh, in Iran as it did in China. And I would also like to join and add something uh, else to this question. You've mentioned the Alex Zarif and uh, uh, one of the things that I'm trying to figure out, who will be the next foreign minister? Leo, I'll be quick and then I'd love to hear other thoughts. Uh, Look, on, on Zarif, if you listen to Zarif himself, the foreign minister are basically at best messengers when it comes to key issues. So I wouldn't be too excited about the identity of the next foreign minister. Um, you know, we've had foreign ministers in recent years that really mattered zero. I mean, poor Manu Chair Motaki's face comes up when I say that. Uh, yes, there are a number of foreign ministers that you can say, you know, frankly, just didn't have much to say. And I would, by the way, put someone like Ali Akbar Velayati in there who was foreign minister about 17 years, he was a messenger. In fact, if you don't have political ambitions and you don't stand for anything, your chances of staying in a job are much greater in, in Tehran in the foreign ministry. Uh, uh, on the China issue, uh, because China came up and then Leo, you mentioned, or the question was about the economy and whether economic uh, linking up to the world economy would make um, you know, perhaps I'm, I'm reading too much into the question, but make the prolong the life of the, the regime. You know, that's what people have been hoping for a long time, that you bring Iran by incentivizing, that you bring the Islamic Republic. Look, if you change your foreign policy, if you make certain adjustments, then there will be benefits to be had. If you have economic benefits, you create jobs in Iran, you create jobs, you employ people, employ people are happier, your job is safer. I mean, in a nutshell, that's basically been the, the argument. It hasn't worked. It hasn't worked. And it could be because ideology is at, at play uh, that some people, and you know, uh, there are folks in Iran who say, we don't want to be Dubai. We have no desire to become Dubai. Dubai for us is, is not the model. We, we're thinking about, I don't know how serious these voices are, but I mean, that, that's at least how they articulate it. But let me just say this. Because uh, Mayor talked about the, uh, the declining social base, and I couldn't agree more. And he also talked about minorities and so on. Again, these are realities that the Islamic Republic has to deal with. 
And Mayor talked about being overconfident. I agree, but I, I like Mayor. I don't know where this overconfidence uh, comes from. But the the fact is this: there's a huge question mark how long the regime can stay the course uh, with the economy performing the way it does. Even if there's a nuclear deal tomorrow in Vienna, what's the best scenario? They're going to be able to sell their oil, and they're going to be able to get the money back through the central bank mechanism. Is that going to be enough to keep Iran's economy intact for, for you know, in a, in a safe manner going forward? Again, that's even that is a big question mark. And, and I just don't see any real desire on the part of uh, the, the, the decision makers in Tehran to, to sort of head on challenge the issue of foreign policy of the Islamic Republic is the reason why the economy is such a mess. And unless you have that debate, you're not going to move forward on that. Maybe the Chinese are going to help Iran. Maybe the re reason why the Ayatollah Khamenei, who just signed a 25-year strategic agreement with China, for whatever it's worth, maybe that overconfidence is that somebody will bail him out. But even if the Chinese come and bail Iran out, the Chinese presumably also want Iran to make some changes in their regional policies in the Middle East, because China, as we know, has close relations with everyone in the Middle East. So one way or another, the post Khamenei er er Iran has to deal with the issue of having to make adjustments to, to their foreign policy. It just can't be what it is. It just, it's not serving, never mind the Iranian people, isn't serving the Iranian regime. And I'll stop here and, and let others speak. Of course. I, I want to raise two, two, two points. I agree that, first of all, globalization, there has been strong opposition in Iran to globalization. After the JCPOA was signed, Rouhani hoped to open Iran to foreign investments and but it was immediately made clear to him by the revolutionary guards that they are opposed to it because they stand to lose. Uh, you cannot have a, a free rational economy existing alongside uh, large parts of the economy dominated by the revolutionary guards. It doesn't work. It will uh, endanger the terrors of the revolutionary guards and they will oppose it. Not only them, many of the conservative clerics I fully agree, oppose globalization because they think this will undermine the Islamic nature of the regime. And they prefer Iran to remain poor, uh, but pure. And, and they are clearly afraid that opening Iran to the world will undermine the regime. So in my view, they will do their utmost to undermine globalization, one. Number two, globalization did not make China more liberal. On the contrary, China under Xi in the past 10 years is becoming increasingly dictatorial and totalitarian. So the belief that if you open the world to the if you open to the world and you have good economic relations with everyone, it makes you a nicer person, doesn't work, unfortunately. And China is a very good slash bad example for this uh, phenomenon. It doesn't necessarily so it doesn't mean that Iran, again, once it becomes integrated, will become a, a wonderful. You no know, peace loving uh, uh, country. And to give you, by the way, one example, which I meant, not mentioned before, look at the banking issue. The um, Expediency Council refuses to authorize the signing of the FATF agreement to allow Iranian banks to integrate in the world banking system. Why? Because it means uh, that the Iran banks will be under scrutiny and Iran will not be able to support terrorist organizations. So they prefer to pay a price and not allow Iran banks to integrate in the world economy. Okay, this is, shows their priority. S third point about Zarif. I fully agree, Zarif does not determine policy. He actually carries out the policy. He is the nice package of a policy. But with all due respect to Zarif, it was not him who decided to go to the nuclear negotiations and uh, Maybe Rouhani could influence Khamenei to accept to cross some of its red lines, but the foreign minister doesn't, in Iran does not determine foreign policy. The moment he will try to be, become too independent, he will be retired. Okay, we have a, a couple of more minutes if uh, anyone else wants to ask a question. Uh, okay. Alex, uh, I would okay. ask a question. Um, <laughs> Well, uh, Iranian elections have always been quite surprising, and uh, I, I assume that the, the most uh, unpredictable uh, development already happened when they disqualified Larry Johnny. But I wonder if you think, uh, for example, that uh, we might have a surprise by having a second round, for example, which might be interesting. 
Thank you. Uh, you know, um, that's a great question. I guess I haven't given it that much thought. You have to play with the numbers to answer that question. So Raisi got in 2017, he got about 16 million votes, um, which was what? Uh, I mean, he, he's going to get 50% less or, or the, the loss could be even greater this time around. Uh, uh, and what I'm trying to get to is the following question. How embarrassing of a low turnout and when will the regime tolerate for AEC? So I am not really answering your question about a second, second round uh, because I, I guess my, my, my bigger, my, my conclusion is AEC has to by this stage win this. There's no way, but you know, to, to answer your question um, or to speculate along with you on this. Um, so you got Saeed Jalili, some people say he has some support. I doubt it. I, I'd say Jalili doesn't have the personality. Um, so I would not think say Jalili would be able to do much. That leaves us with Mohsen Rizai. Again, the man is, is a repeated failure at this game of president. So uh, uh, Khatami and the reform movement have already come out and said they're not going to support anyone, which means him, I mean, remember in 2013, if I remember right, Hassan Rouhani had like 5% in the opinion polls. And then the reform movement leaders came behind him and he shot up. But they're not going to do that for him, Matthew, or Mehrali Zadeh. So where is that injection of you know, opium or whatever into his arm going to come from? Steroids, I should say. Um, I don't know. I mean, it's so to me at this point, um, and I, you know, I, I just don't know. I, you, I love to hear your thoughts on this. You follow it as much as I do. What do you think? I mean, if there is a second round, who needs to eat into Raisi's vote um, to, you know, reduce his share to less than fifty percent? Well, the only one who, 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 I, who I don't think he, he, he can do that. But uh, I do think I do think that there is gr somehow growing support for him. Uh, and uh, the Kargoz the uh, and the Kargozaran might support him is Hamati, and I think that if he does very well in the debates, uh, which he might do because he's the only one who who can speak uh, about economy and he really knows something about economy, uh, unlike the other candidates, uh, he might do some uh, perhaps better than we expect him to do, and then if if he gets even ten to fifteen percent. Uh, that might force uh, AC into a second round if all the others, of course, uh, receive uh, in total um, more than you know. Uh, we have to play again with with the numbers, but but if Hamet is, is able to to reach the uh, 10, 15 percent, that might reach the the, the risky uh, point uh, for uh, for AC. Uh, again, I. I I doubt it. If, I doubt it if he can do that, uh, but uh, we have to remember that when it comes to the to the last few days, uh, I'm not sure that the reformists who really think that here 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 we, we might have Raisi as president, uh, they won't decide eventually to uh, to decide again. Okay, uh, we have to to choose between the evil and the worse. And the Hamati might be a, a good choice. Yeah, yeah, no, I hear you. But there is the scenario that the uh, that Ayatollah Khamenei has to engineer high voter turnout for Hamati for the second of the election show. Um, yeah. I mean, it's it. it I mean, Hamati is a technocrat, as you know. Nobody knows the man really, and the one thing he's known for is having been at the role of the central uh, bank governor at a time when the Iranian economy has been nosediving, I mean, free fall, the dollar declining, inflation, all the rest of it. There's nothing good uh, that one can associate with Hamati's name if you're trying to get or gauge the public's uh, view of the man. And it's unfortunate because he's not responsible for 98% of the things that you know he's supposed to fix. It's all in the foreign ministry's realm. He gets to have to you know fix something else's, someone else's uh, broken uh, policies, but that's just, uh, unfortunately for him in an election cycle, I just, as, as I said, I think it really requires election fraud for him at his vote to go up at this point, right? I just, I just don't see any enthusiasm. The country has given up on the idea of gradual reform. 
and this is a fight among hardliners now. And Hemati is not a hardliner. And you know, putting his wife on national TV to say he's a good man is not gonna is gonna it's not gonna save the day for him. Okay, uh, thank you, Alex. Uh, David, would you like to add something? Hello, thank you. Uh, yes, one point about what Ras said. It, it is what you said about is uh, having 50% uh, or not is based on the assumption that all the candidates approved will be running. And if Khamenei will listen to you, he will remove some of them. Yeah, good point. Right. Okay, so I guess if we have to answer the question as uh, the circumstances show us at this particular minute, then reform in the Islamic Republic uh, perhaps is possible, but uh, not at this round. Will I be wrong to make this uh, speculation? I'll leave it to someone else to speculate. I'll refer you to an article that uh, Ziba Kalam wrote at the peak of the corona in Iran. He said that the ref reformism passed away, but we didn't hold ceremonies because of the COVID. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is, <laughs> this is a great point. Okay, uh, so uh, we, are, uh, we ran out of time. I want to uh, thank you uh, Alex for uh, joining us and uh, for your interesting points that you've made. Uh, also, thank you, Mayor, uh, for your input. Uh, thank you all and uh, be well. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.